how do you look as a futurist? It's very much looking at the trends you can see. Uh, it's very hard to spot uh, wildcards, but it's then understanding the level of transformation. So it's like if you put a rock into a lake, you have to understand how many circles is it going to create and how is it going to impact different areas. So it's really, and I actually really believe this, that, that being a futurist should be a part of any DNA of a business these days, really understanding the changes and understanding what new competences will it take for me. And I know very well that you are sitting in all kinds of positions and chairs right now. And that's a big challenge is to bridge it to your own reality and actually bridge it to the now. So already back in 96, when I worked at the European Commission, uh, we made scenarios for European integration. And in one of the scenarios, we had Brexit. And uh, already back then we could see, you know, the UK's very hesitance towards the European community. You know, they had their colonies, their global outlook. Why, why should they be a part of this uh, exclusive uh, little circle? Why should they be together with the Germans, you know, the losers of the Second World War? So we very rapidly could see that uh, unless, you know, they, they're in it for the money and we really have to build in a culture and, and some European identity into this, otherwise we'll lose them. So the scenario is it's not about leaning back saying, I told you so when the future is finally happening. It's very much uh, to give you an early warning sign as to how to accommodate. And what I'm going to do is I'm giving you some trends and then of course you have to try and link it to your reality. And as Vibeka said, you know, you are very welcome to pose any question that you like. Uh, being a futurist is exactly about posing the interesting questions, looking into the uncertainties and finding out how to deal with it in the present. So in January 27th, uh, I had a whole uh, group of different uh, businesses together and uh, that morning we actually had the Chinese flag that had been abused as the coronavirus. And the other one was uh, factories closing down in Wuhan. And I asked, so guys, what do you think will have the biggest level of transformation? The Chinese flag or Wuhan? And you're welcome right now to write in the chat. What do you think that people thought would have the big, biggest transformative power? The uh, closing down in Wuhan uh, already there. We said, well, if that is happening, it could be the beginning of a global recession, closing down of borders. And then, of course, the Chinese flag, everybody said, oh, it's the Muhammad drawings. We have already tried that. We saw what happened in France. And now the Chinese had seen us, you know, we are in trouble. So I'm already giving you the answer here. A hundred percent said, well, the Chinese flag, that would be having the big transformative powers. And that's a challenge. Very often you see these things that are going to be very transformative for our society. Uh, but you have a tendency to look at your past experiences and saying, oh, but I know the Muhammad drawings and I know exactly what happened to uh, our country back then. So uh, my, my brain is able to forecast that it's much harder when we see other kinds of changes. So let me try and, and run through some of the changes that are coming about within culture uh, due to the COVID-19. And guys, I miss you so much. I really miss having an audience. So please, before I start, just give yourself a hug. I need a hug. You feel really alone standing in a room day in and day out uh, from this. So um, yeah. So first of all, the first uh, and I most important thing uh, is when you work as a futurist, it's so important that you don't say, this is great or this is bad or this will be a bright future or this will be a black future. We have a tendency uh, immediately to decide, you know, is it dangerous or is it good? Being a futurist is a being a professional, uh, curious person. And you can only be curious if you don't have an idea of whether things are good and or bad. So, so the only principle I want you to take with you as being a futurist here together with me that for the next hour is to say interesting, exciting. So when you see uh, Trump going bananas and now uh, Capitol Hill, you say interesting, exciting. As a futurist, you have to say 
uh, interesting, exciting, and then saying what sort of tendencies do we see within this rather than whether it's good or bad, because as soon as we do that, we get these blankets on. Um, so so uh, while you do that, uh, you have to open up. So before we move on, say interesting, exciting after me. Yes, I can hear that. And, and put your arms into it, interesting, exciting. So especially if something is really annoying that you really think, ah, what is going on here? You know, you go into the futurist mode saying interesting, exciting. Let me explore this a little closer. So, for instance, deep fake is uh, one way of manipulating stories uh, these days. You can deep fake faces uh, and basically you can get people to say anything. And instead of saying, oh, this is terrible and what is going to happen to democracy, you say, interesting, exciting. Where can I download the app? OK, it's this Chinese app and I immediately downloaded uh, the app on my phone and um, experimented. Uh, I went to bed with the future, which I call it, and I downloaded and I tried to film myself from different uh, angles, uh, getting other people to say things from my mouth. And then I realized, well, in the afternoon, uh, when my hair is nice and my makeup is good, when I then had meetings, with Australia in the morning, well, I should do video films of myself in the afternoon looking good. And then when I had the morning meetings at 7.30 with Australia, I should put on the fake video. Interesting, exciting, you know, then I look fantastic on all my Zoom and Teams meeting. Uh, so, uh, and that's uh, the opportunities that you really don't see if you are immediately closing down saying this is a terrible technology. Technologies are just tools, so we have to understand how can it rehumanize people? How will it change our approach to things? Amen. Applying for jobs? Oh, I could come as this uh, robot, Sophia, who already has a citizenship in Saudi Arabia. I hope I you can hear uh, the movies. Vibeka, is it okay? Just put a thumb up. Great. Um, so, so uh, being a futurist is very much about saying, and then what, and then what. So, if I give you another example, um, uh, we will have uh, in the next five years, we'll be able to lick our screens and we'll actually be able to taste. So instead of going to the restaurant, just ordering some takeaway food, you can have the taste on your taste buds. And that is coming uh, from a university right now. And then you can say, OK, uh, and then what? You have to say, and how can we use it? Is that going to be a new Tinder application so you can taste your date before you meet? Or will we use it uh, in the cinema or will we use it in the gaming? How are we going to go about using that uh, technology? Uh, so, so basically, uh, like you can mix all colors, you can mix all tastes. Uh, so we'll have a new dimension uh, coming in to society. But one thing is that the technology is there. It's more how is it going to change the world as we know it. Culture wise, uh, a lot of things has happened here uh, during COVID-19. You have a huge level of innovations in terms of how we meet. Uh, in terms of the environment, we talked about green wash washing. The new word now is clean washing, where uh, the cleaners put notes on the chair and the table saying this has been cleaned. You can feel absolutely certain here. And I can tell you it's not going to go back like we had terror attacks. Uh, we now have a terror prepared city. Uh, likewise, we will have a pandemic prepared businesses and societies and urban environments. So. Uh, the, those uh, sort of, of things have come uh, to stay or if you will be able to uh, be ready in a completely different extent uh, for the next uh, situation. Uh, another thing that has happened is this democratizing uh, of society. Uh, Getty, the Getty Museum in Los Angeles, they have actually managed to democratize their, uh, their museum. Uh, they made this uh, competition at uh, Instagram, where you should take some pictures in your own home and you should replicate the arts that they had hanging on the walls. And it was such a great success. It trended all over the world. And I tell you, once society opens up again, people will go to the Getty Museum because now it's their museum and not some elitist outing for the few in the local area. So they have really managed to bring stories to life uh, worldwide. Um, 
succeeding in that. And uh, you know as well, you have some artists who have really managed to change to earn 20 times more than they used to by uh, staging in uh, in the gaming universe uh, that has been replicated several times, but a fantastic way of bringing different stages uh, together. Again, this is not something that is going away again. Uh, they are going to maintain uh, exactly that. Then you have uh, a much more engaging approach in culture. Uh, this is Smokfesten in Skanderborg in Jylland. Uh, they sold out these kits, which are basically just selling beer and chips and funny hats and drinks, and they call it the Smokfest. Uh, and they were they were sold out immediately, and that's because people feel extremely loyal to their events, and you can capitalize on that. And again, uh, once we see culture moving back, we'll have this digital layer on top. I'm working a lot with the cultural houses of Denmark, so they might have an artist in one location, uh, let's say in Birgerød, where there's one, and then they have a famous uh, singer coming out there live, and then it will be transmitted in real time to all the other cultural centers. So you will actually go either to your local cinema or your local cultural center, and you'll be able to chat in real time with this artist. You'll be able to go backstage. You will be able to see a little documentary of how their life was, and then you will see them live. And at the same time, you can hang out with your neighbors. So that kind of combining different layers, going much deeper, emerging yourself much more in the experiences, that is really something that has accelerated everywhere. So you go to the museum in Copenhagen for an exhibition on modern women uh, in Gamle Strand, uh, which is there right now, and suddenly also have a layer bringing you to all the exhibitions of modern women all over the world uh, as an extra bringing the story to life. So, so uh, it has accelerated at the same time as culture has been put, uh, has been suffering a lot. And uh, another thing that has been really notable is how these artists have been able to brainstorm and chat across borders uh, during the lockdown, something that they have never had the opportunity to do, to do before. So I promise you we'll have this huge wave of creativity once we get back uh, to the world. Oh, I have to get used to changing here. And then we have another interesting thing that we're actually using all these smart layers of data to find out what is happening to people. Uh, and uh, you actually have culture now on prescription because you can actually measure that people who are depressed or feeling lonely, they will feel much better going to the cinema or going to see the theater and they can actually measure betterment of people. And I think that's interesting. We have known that around sports for a long time, but that you can actually also uh, work on people at that level, whether it's gaming or uh, other cultural activities, we are gaining a lot of insights as to how is that actually impacting on people. So before I move on to these lasting trends of the pandemic, I would love to hear you. So have you experimented with the future during COVID-19 and how? And it's not by accident I have this guy sitting in front of a tent because I can tell you all the outdoor activities, they have skyrocketed. So everybody who's selling tents and outdoor equipment, they have almost doubled their sales. And if you can see this uh, binocular uh, looking at birds, looking at the tiny details in nature, that is trending too. So if you go by the lakes or anywhere, you will have these fantastic cameras where people are zooming in on small details. And I think somehow it's uh, it's uh, this uh, spending so much time for walk and talk and in nature. Uh, it's going to be very interesting uh, to see whether it lasts. You can see that it's been sold a lot of Corona dogs. Uh, so at least they live for another 13 years. So we will need to go uh, with those uh, for a walk. Have we had any uh, surprises here, Vivica, that you want to talk about or should we uh, move on? Well, I can't see from the audience, but uh, I mean, we could not get a dog, but we got a mouse for sure. <laughs> and uh, I've been walking many, many walks with my family and playing a lot of cards. And I've also been experimenting with a lot of uh, drinks. 
quite interesting. So, uh, but uh, let's uh, move on and then we'll see if something pops up. Uh, so alcohol consumption has gone up. Um, uh, other things that are interesting, the treatment guarantees at hospitals uh, that was put out of place, but uh, people because they started working with their back age, age oh, and, and their, their, their knee problems, actually the waiting list have halved during the pandemic, so people have cured themselves moving around a bit, so I think that's interesting. Newborn babies have been putting on weight like never before because these young mothers, they had a whole week for themselves together with the babies without the whole family coming in, uh, needing coffee and tea and flowers put into vases. So it has really improved uh, the breastfeeding. Uh, so so uh, that are some of the taboos that you would never have experienced uh, with experimented with uh, had we not had uh, the pandemic. So looking into taboos are actually also very interesting when working with the future, but we have so many trends, so I'll move on uh, to those. So uh, the first uh, trend is that we are being set free to create our own stories. We are really moving from uh, time slaves to time owners, and that is not everybody, but people who can to some extent uh, decide where to work from. And that is a huge uh, difference. It's not just a question of being at home or being in the office, but we expect that 40% of the time we can actually work from home or many people can work from home. And then people who will not be able to work from home, uh, like uh, your normal school teacher or nursery teacher or frontline hospital people, they will to a greater extent feel themselves as being time slaves because everybody else can decide when to do what, and poverty is always relative. So for instance, people who felt lonely before the pandemic, they have made a survey in 26 countries, they actually feel less lonely now. So uh, that is quite interesting because they say, well, everybody else is sitting at home, so it doesn't feel so bad being on my own. And some other people are breaking down. Another uh, experience that has happened is that the guys in the Nordic countries, they have spent a lot of time with their children. And I know that the paternity leave is already great in countries like Sweden, but in Denmark, it has been very hard to get the guys to be at home with the children. But uh, a lot of women are working in the public sector, so the guys are working more tech and they have actually uh, been able to stay at home with these uh, school kids. And the question is whether they will demand to spend more time with their kids once society go back. Uh, the book you see there, uh, Aftershocks and Opportunity in a Post-Pandemic Society, is actually a book that I wrote with uh, 14 other futurists from around the globe. And I can tell you this is a trend that belongs to the Nordic countries. In a lot of countries around the world, women have lost their job and they are the one going back uh, to the kids, especially because they, the nanny had to be sent home during the pandemic and they were stuck with everything. So again, the future looks very different according to what culture you're coming from. And uh, at this specific session, I'm going to talk from, from the Nordic perspective. So, so the big change here is really moving from going on your automatic pilot uh, in sitting at your workstation saying, OK, so what should I be doing today uh, to actually being much more conscious about what sort of work activity do I need to do? Uh, what sort of value do I need to do? So that's why I mean that it's bringing personal stories to life, really moving from a work life balance to a life work balance, finding out what sort of personality do I have? Do I work well in the morning or in the afternoon? Am I social? Would I like some alone time? Uh, how is my life situation? What about my family? Uh, is there anybody there who is particularly vulnerable? Uh, do I have room to go for myself or do I need a third pop-up place? A lot of people have been using their cars in this period of time actually as the only place they could be uh, outside. And again, if you're sitting as a manager, this will create uh, huge stresses and strains on how it used to be uh, because you need to accommodate this bottom-up storytelling of how people want and feel. And at the same time, you need to create something which is better for the whole. 
So to give you an example, if you look at young people, they all say, oh, I want my own room, my own kitchen and my own toilet. And when we look at uh, what gives them the good grades in school and what makes them stick to university is that if they live together and if they have a caring community where they help each other, then they get better grade and they stay at university and their satisfaction rate is greater as well. So, so you can't just ask people what they want. As a manager of the future, you also have to find out the collective good. How do we onboard people? How do we uh, have a culture where there's room for taboos? And here it's really, really uh, important to find that balance. I think Denmark and Norway and Sweden and Finland, Finland is, is the most happy country in the world are extremely well positioned to do exactly that. Uh, because what makes a country the happiest country in the world? It's trust. So in the Nordic countries, we have more than 76% of us, we trust strangers. We trust strangers to do the best that they can. So we are willing to set them free because we think, okay, go and do whatever you can give up your watch and move to a compass instead, finding out how to add value. I trust that you will do your best. In France, for instance, it's less than 22% who trust other people. You can see it in uh, another prediction, which I did already a year ago, that the anti-vax people, uh, they are more than a 50% now in France because they don't trust people. In Denmark, we are far more pro-vax. Uh, we are trusting that, of course, it's going to bring us something good. So there are huge cultural differences. But in terms of writing our own stories at the labor market, we are positioned very well because we have the trust. And the other, the second thing that you need for a happy country is freedom. It's freedom to do uh, whatever you like. You can have any family structure you like. You don't necessarily need to dress up in a suit every day to go to work. Do whatever you please and uh, there's a huge level of tolerance for that. Uh, if some people are organizing their life in one way and other people are doing it another, we accept that as long as they deliver on the result. Um, so what is this uh, meaning? And we've been very proud that people have not been so uh, infected by, by COVID-19. And of course, we have one million people in Denmark alone and um, almost 50 percent are living by themselves in the Nordic countries. So you have a lot of people uh, who are having a very individualistic approach to society. And I think this mukbang, mukbang trend uh, is where people eat with a YouTuber between seven and eight o'clock in the evening is a great example of how we uh, have uh, adapted to a very individualistic uh, lifestyle where um, we uh, try to uh, get, in, get cheered up by, by, by these uh, external input. She never says anything, this YouTuber. She only prepares the food and then she will eat it with you. You can try to log on tonight at seven o'clock and have a dinner with her. I'm not saying there are not tiny sexual uh, tones in this as well, but uh, it's very popular. Please, Jeff. And of course, as a futurist, I can't help thinking that laziness is a very important driving force as how our society is going. We love to say, and then I should do this, and then I should go for picnic, and then I should, and then we can just see in everyday life that whenever things get easier, we are a little bit like water, we go there. So you remember when you had to pay by putting your credit card into a machine, pushing down a coat, terrible, you know, if you can just smile to the camera. And one of the things that has really accelerated, uh, I'm working with the VASA agency in Australia, they're doing these chatbots. It's, uh, they expect these chatbots to, to fill up uh, basically 90% of all our search by 2023. So uh, to begin with, you know, we stop talking to each other 
uh, and we started texting each other instead because it's just oh, if I call V because she might answer back and it will take a long time. So it's much easier that we just text each other. And uh, so we stopped talking and I actually had a, a homeless on stage just before lockdown. Simon, he'd been living on the street for eight years and uh, I, I was uh, talking to him about sleeping on a bench in Copenhagen and we have the most cameras everywhere and why did nobody you know come and get you when you were only 17 and lying on this bench and he said yes and that was terrible and he communicated in this tent with I think we were 500 people there it was at uh, Bonholz Folkemøde and then uh, at one point I'm saying but Simon you're so good at communicating and he said yes well, I sit on a bench every day and communicate with people for eight hours. So, of course, I'm good at communicating. But during the same time, I have just experienced that nobody's talking to each other any longer. You know, they are uh, in their ear. They have their earbuds on. They hear their podcasts and, and they don't talk. And the next step here are these chatbots that will actually be able to be your favorite communication partner. They will entertain you. Uh, they'll be able to listen to you, they will adapt to you. Playing jazz. Smoothie. Making smoothie. Calendar. No meetings today. Remember, dentist at 9.30. Fire off. Fire off. Open door. Door open. And we're going to do one more. All right. Open door. Wrong voice command. Open door. Wrong voice command. Open door. Repeat that. Open door. I didn't understand that. Hey, open door. Play on the floor. Sing on the floor. Open the door. Open the door. Open the door. Play jazz. Playing jazz. So uh, what does it, this mean? That it means that we'll uh, maybe work from home for 40% of the time. Uh, we will have uh, uh, these, uh, we will, might well find completely new way of, of housing, of living. We will have, uh, in, in some countries, they're deciding that the work from home day is on Friday. You have seen the booming in the sale of summer houses. We might take these three days off. Uh, to experience, uh, to go on these sh uh, short uh, vacations, uh, but we're also getting this local patriotism. Where do I actually live? Do I want to commute uh, to work or can I find three colleagues of mine uh, nearby where I live? Uh, can I invite them home for lunch in my house or in my flat? Uh, so, so these borders are being broken down. So if I want to summarize this, we are really moving from Remember the old days where we could only sleep at hotels and then we compared them, you know, do they have room service and a 24 hour porch here? Uh, and then you had Airbnb coming and suddenly realized, you know, I can sleep in a tree, I can sleep on a boat, I can have a trampoline and, and the whole uh, notion of sleeping over just completely changed. Our mind just blew up with all the opportunities. We are going to see the same thing with our work life. It's bringing many stories to life. It's not going to be one size fit all. It's going to be many sizes fit many people. And that's going to challenge us in the first run because it's really hard to be your own boss. Uh, but once uh, we start dealing with this, we will see uh, completely new outputs. The other one is this is stupid or smart. Of course, we have accelerated completely these smart data around us uh, during the COVID-19. Uh, we are getting these digital twins. Uh, you have uh, the ability to actually hear on my voice whether I'm about to develop a depression, whether I'm about to cough, whether I'm stressed, whether I don't understand what you are saying. And I spoke to uh, Watson, um, a guy from there, John Smith, and he told me in the future, when you go to the cinema with your son, my son is 17 and he can look at the worst horror movies, whether it's Stranger Things or whatever. I sit like this, I can't hear, I can't see, I'm so scared, I don't get anything out of it. And he said, well, in this future, we'll be able to caliber the stories so it will be tailored completely to your emotional needs. 
and then we can gear it up so he can have a caliber 25 and look at all the blood. So for the first time in history, you can actually leave the stories and you had the same experience, but a very different caliber of the same story. So um, really this, uh, this one says that you can have a nice cinema uh, tour for all age groups. Well, that will make much more sense when it's tailored to me. So you haven't seen anything yet when it comes to individualization and that is just tuning up very rapidly. Um, likewise, if you look at the gaming, that has also been accelerated like crazy and we have moved from gaming being a, a periphery, are you a gamer or you're not a gamer, to what games do you play? Everybody is a gamer these days and it's uh, and here is really an area where uh, you have the best artists coming in now, you have the best instructors, and you can really bring stories to life. That said, of course, uh, they should be careful that they're not ending in the same category as Netflix, where their boss said, you know, uh, our biggest competitor is your night's sleep. And you have actually looked at production rate going down because people are binging movies till late at night and they go to work like with the hangover the next day because they uh, can't turn it off. In China, they have actually decided that the gamer should only have 90 minutes a day and they turn off the internet at 10 o'clock at night. And I think that's uh, a good example of uh, interesting, exciting how the Chinese government is taking responsibility on behalf of its citizens when they say, well, it gives them something good, but it can also take overhand. So we go into this um, new century where it's about uh, rehumanizing people again, just like the work life. It's also in terms of our consumptions of entertainment and education. How do we create a nice balance that gets something better out of people rather than pushing them, getting the most out of people like they were a lemon. So it's it's a big uh, transformation going on here. Uh, what I really so let's think now is have cool, a look at what that might be like. As, as a futurist, it's really how uh, all these pattern recognitions that are coming now and AI will be able to uh, fast forward me. So uh, if I live as I live now, as I commute and if I communicate as I do now, how will my life be in five years to now? So actually that you are actually able to envision these different futures. That is a, a very powerful way to get people to act because they can actually try living that future and then going back saying, what do we want? So if you ask me about the next American presidential election, we might well see these simulations of how the world uh, might be. And then we uh, decide from that. This is just a great way of showing how the weather is changing. So you actually understand it with your head and your heart and your stomach. Example. We know Florence is going to bring one to three feet of inundation across many locations. That certainly is enough to knock you off your feet. It can definitely stall cars out and even carry cars away. So, uh, so we can scroll in time, we can adapt, and then we're looking into this emotional uh, data. Uh, so for a long time you had, you know, a plane like a Boeing flying across the sky. You would know exactly uh, that it needed to change spare parts. And it's incredible that we haven't done that with people before, understanding uh, what makes them thrive. And finally, I have to point to one technology which I find is really interesting. Uh, it's this um, uh, GP3, uh, which is this uh, automated uh, script writing algorithm so you can get a computer to write an article. Uh, you still have to put the bits and pieces together, but uh, they ask, the Guardian asked the computer actually to write an article about why we shouldn't be worried uh, about artificial intelligence. And then they put together the pieces. And that is of course uh, exploding as well. Uh, so what we should see now is not computers replacing people, but it's augmenting people. It's lifting us up. We are having almost an extra brain we could have it embedded in us with uh, Elon Musk and his Neuralink, um, but that is happening. And here we are going very slow in the Nordic countries compared to the rest of the world, because as you know, China is going to 
move very fast and they have done that during COVID uh, tracking people uh, and they don't have any hesitance in using whatever uh, machine learning device that they need in order to fix the environment, in order to fix people. In America, it's a, a commercial uh, way that uh, we in the Nordic countries are going to adapt to. We are going to have Amazon and talking to Amazon, I want to do this, I want to do that. Um, so it is entering the Nordic reading region as well, and we are willing to deal with private data in order to get information. And then, of course, we have our own GDPR. So <laughs> the last trend I want to talk about is that uh, and that's always interesting if we are taking this uh, broad theme covering a lot of areas of bringing stories to life. Who is going to be the villains and who are going to be the heroes? For a long time, you know, age was just a number. Uh, so we had this um, blurring of age, you know, uh, you could uh, very much as a pensioner live like a, a young person. Uh, so you decide yourself what sort of life phase you're in. And we as futurists have talked a lot about that. That is really changing. We are seeing a, a gap here. We're seeing a gap in how uh, people are dealing and especially in terms of age. This is from Wuhan and it's just to say we can really look forward to these huge parties coming on uh, as soon as we start vaccinating uh, society. <laughs> And um, so there's no doubt, you know, we will go back. Uh, we have all these. Um, we have a lot of people who can't wait to party, who can't wait to go out again. So, uh, I mean, I, I really expect partying to take off completely crazy because we have been to a war and like when you held your hand of your first boyfriend, it was a very big thing. Well, the first really kissing with the tongue and hugging, it's going to be really, really big for us. It's uh, it's always like that. If you have a scarce resource, uh, it is becoming the luxury. So we will, when we meet, really take care. And all surveys shows that if you hug somebody, if you hear their voice, if you see their body language, something fantastic happens. In terms of heroes and villains, you have a black man. He was our main refugees in X Factor before the pandemic. He's so yesterday now, you know, he was like, you are in and you are out judging individuals. Now we are together apart and that is changing culture uh, for always. On top of that, we have uh, a lot of uh, politicized active citizens, youth from around the world. We have the Me Too, we have the I Can't Breathe. And what is really interesting here is that numerically, a lot of these young people, they don't get anything out of our democratic system because you have more elderly people. But they are mobilizing very rapidly using the social media. And uh, as you know, we have uh, several uh, people uh, in the Nordic countries that have lost their jobs. Uh, we had um, uh, and and uh, it's really a generation gap. So you have some people who just cannot understand what is going on. It's not that they don't want. Uh, we have a photographer, Jan Graup, who has been taking all these war, war photos and he just doesn't know uh, what is going on. Uh, why uh, he understands what uh, Sophie Linde is talking about, not having sexual harassment, but he's now scared of employing women or having women interns because he doesn't understand this uh, Me Too. So you really have a generation gap here and uh, issues that can be simplified, those will be trending and they are creating a different kind of vulnerability. So if you look at Seoul right now, we have this big case of how can we pick a white guy, he might be the best in the whole world, to do the voiceover for a black guy. Uh, and that then all the good ratings, you know, they fall apart because uh, we have a generation who are not willing to compromise around this. And again, I sat with youth from 50 different nations and they said, Lisa, in the future, you know, we only want to work for businesses who have this purpose, who are uh, living up to the United Nations uh, sustainability goals. 
uh, those are the only one we want to work for. We only want to share data with them and we only want to buy the, those guys products. So please make us a LinkedIn where they are the only one who can enter because we don't even want to see the others. They don't exist anymore. And it's really um, very interesting to see uh, how this is going to play out. So you have a hero now, uh, which is Jonas. He's created this youth a movie called uh, Granza. He's made several ones. So he listened a lot to his young audience of 17 year old uh, high school students and they write in what should the next episode be about. And you have this whole karma around it that established businesses, established stories, you know, they don't listen to you. Uh, they are the enemy. Uh, so, so you have a different kind of hero emerging, whereas the old heroes like Jan Graf, he's just you know, sorry guy, you lost it, you're no longer a role model, we fired you. And it's happening overnight. And um, again, remember to say interesting, exciting. As a futurist, I'm not bringing this up to say whether it's good or bad. It's just very interesting to follow uh, how this is uh, uh, unfolding. If we look at the Capitol Hill uh, situation again, 80% of the people who occupied Capitol Hill they actually spent their time creating stories themselves that they posted on TikTok, that they posted on Instagram, that they posted on YouTube. So it was one live movie uh, story. So, so this guy who's waving to the camera, it's not the best way to become a criminal, right? Um, but it's again a very interesting way of seeing how um, you have these uh, movements taking over, creating their own stories, creating their own reality and uh, broadcasting uh, this. Um, and then uh, in the old days, <laughs> we had, uh, you know, uh, Bruce Willis or Arnold Schwarzenegger, we will have a hero, you know, who will come and save the day uh, and, and fix everything. So we'll sit there in our sofas and wait for the happy ending for some guys to fix it all. Now we have our prime minister, Mette, who might might not uh, fix it all. But, but uh, where the trend is going is really it's a leaderless society. It's more almost like Al Qaeda. I can use that without saying we should be like Al Qaeda but having these cells communicating with each other, developing sign language. And something which I find is fascinating is that a lot of young people are now being prosecuted in Hong Kong. Well, they have then decided, OK, then we fight against the Thai king uh, because we will not be prosecuted for that. That's completely legal in Hong Kong. And the people in Thailand, they are then fighting for democratizing Hong Kong. So they have actually swapped enemies. Uh, which I think is a fantastic ability that that many people can communicate, they can make strategy and they can change. And there is not one single leader you can call because the strength is actually this dispersion of power. And I think it, it reminds me a little bit of what I was talking about, how we are moving from work-life balance to life-work balance. There, there is some trend going on here. I can see in everything where it's, it's very much um, that we are bringing ourselves and our lives uh, out. What will happen now is, is uh, a long term rebuild and uh, in, in New Zealand they are working on the well-being budget where they actually use all these data points to measure the well-being. What is your network? How well are you at socializing? How well are you at using culture? And then they can make the prediction of how you will actually do in society. And this is really interesting for you guys at, Nordi at Nordisk Film and Ekman because they have suddenly found out that uh, it's a psychological well-being, which is the most important investment for people because you want them to be active. You want them to be able to find a job. Uh, so right now we see a situation where some people are binging, other people are extremely active, creating things, creating story, creating their own life and value. And uh, well, in New Zealand, they say that's why the most important investment should be in the culture, in the psychological well-being, in engaging people, because then they find a job, then they become happy, then they find a nice husband, then they get healthy kids. So, for instance, in Denmark, we have now found out that you earn 12 crowns per kilometer. You go bicycling. 
uh, because then you don't get ill. Your mentally, mental well-being gets better. You get more social because you look up instead of sitting in a car. Uh, so that kind of calculation is really transforming and will form the rebuilding process. And here it's really going to be an important part whether you are part of the villains or the heroes. It's a corona, we'll take